be seated. As we begin the service this morning, back to the family, I want to thank all of you for being here today. And obviously, we're here today to celebrate uh, the life of Dr. Bob Michelle. His life, I would say, is safe and well. And as we begin, just before I pray, I'm just going to say the first one. service, but I had the opportunity for the first time to meet Dr. Bob Shelton when I was in high school, actually. I attended a small church in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I can remember the high school student, Dr. Shelton, coming to uh, preach for a prophecy conference at our church there, Temple Baptist Church there in Fredericksburg, Virginia. That's the church that I was saved out of. This eight-year-old boy came to dinner at our house. I remember sharing a meal with him at that time. In fact, uh, there were a few times where I asked him, do you remember that? And he claimed he did. So, uh, <laughs> probably he did. But, uh, I remember sharing a meal around the table with some high school students at that time, um, having no idea whatsoever that uh, one day I'd be standing here for a service like this. And I want to say that it's a special privilege for me to have part of the opening service, to say a few words. Um, as I think about Dr. Bob Shelton, a few things that come to mind. He said we're here to celebrate his life and his Savior. And I would say that this is a man uh, where both of those things, powerful, uh, came to him. Life and Jesus Christ. And this was a man who devoted servant of the Lord and gave his life to that. Literally served the Lord on the mission field, uh, then traveling around all over the country preaching. I don't know how many places in different parts of the world, but I know that he was a man mightily used of the Lord uh, for the years that God gave him. And uh, you know, there are a few things that kind of stick out in my mind, just practical things uh, along the way. One of the things that I'll, I'll probably never forget is that every time uh, we had the opportunity to have a conversation, uh, and it would always go to uh, the Lord's return and just the situation, the various things going on in the world. And he would almost inevitably say, I mean, almost every time, he said, you know, John, I wouldn't be surprised if the Lord didn't come back next month. And uh, I think about every time he I think he fully anticipated that. I think that's the right posture for all of us. But we ought to anticipate the Lord's return. And uh, I mean, I, we know it's near than it was yesterday, right? And so uh, he really did love and long for the year of his Savior, Jesus Christ. I was thinking this past week um, that his participation in the rapture is going to look a little different than he thought it would. I think he thought he would live long enough to go up. Uh, he's gone before, so he's going to come down just a little ways and meet us, and then we'll all join him uh, at that time. So it's not going quite as he planned uh, or anticipated, but I don't think he's complaining one bit at the moment. Uh, he's probably checking um, all the facts that he preached about the timeline of things, and maybe even trying to straighten the Lord himself out on those. I, I can't imagine the conversations taking place there in heaven. Uh, you know, he was also to me always a gentleman. Uh, I don't know what other word to use than the fact that he was always kind. Uh, he he always showed respect for, for everyone around him, and he was a man that lived his life in such a way that. It deserved the respect of others as well. And, uh, I don't know what time that I was around him, but he just wasn't a kind, gentle man, uh, a true servant of the Lord. The Bible says that he must not strive with the gentle toward all men. This was Dr. Bob Shelton for me, my relationship with him. Uh, he was always very gracious. Uh, and another thing that comes to mind uh, just a constant encouragement to be around. Um, I don't think we ever again had a conversation. 
organization for him to get to do some work and encourage him. In fact, every time he would come in to the church, the church services, one thing he would always say, uh, we shake hands and greet one another, another, he would always say, John, you're doing a good job. Keep up the good work. They always did. I mean, every time he said, you're doing a good job, keep up the good work. And um, that's the kind of So it really is a privilege to be able to be a part of this service today. I'll just uh, end with these words and then I'll open this in prayer. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I've thought about uh, those words a lot. And there are probably very few people really who think about those Spirit of God allowed him to say it. It's almost like when he said it and, and it was inscripturated, that was like God's way of saying that when he says that, that's true. What that means. When he says for to be to live as Christ and to die as gain, I'm going to inscripturate that as a confirmation that his testimony is true. And that's a large statement. For someone to say for to be to live. Christ. You know, the second part we get, right, is die is gain. I think all of us get that. Uh, but the first part presents quite a standard, quite a challenge. And I think there are probably very few people really in the world today, Christian people, that can say that first part. And it really, really means it. But I think Dr. Shelton. Live is Christ. And now, to die, well, it's just dice and one day. That's all the game. So we can rejoice today on his behalf. And so can we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. And that's why we can call this today, in a real sense, a celebration. A celebration of life. And we need not talk about Dr. Shelton in the past tense. He was the is. He still is those things, right? Uh, because he lives and that he lives our Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray together as we open your service. Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Thank you for how that truth uh, can change our lives and even beyond that, change our destinies. We thank you today for your son, Jesus Christ, that you sent to this world to become sin for us. And Father, we're thankful that you have provided for us a Savior through your Son. And Lord, we rejoice today in that salvation. We rejoice in all that it affords us as your people. And we only know the half of what it really affords us, but Brother Shelton knows now in full all that comes with that great transaction that took place in his life one day when he received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Father, we thank you for the victory that is ours over death and the grave again through your Son. Thank you that you raised him from the dead on the third day and that his resurrection is ours. Thank you for the promise of your word that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So we rejoice today on behalf of Brother Shelton, that he is in your presence. Father, we thank you that uh, he is able to enjoy that dwelling with you and all the fruit of his labor and his devotion. And Father, we are here today to celebrate life well lived. We're here to celebrate life that was devoted to your son, Jesus Christ. And so we seek to honor both Brother Shelton and his Savior. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.
on behalf of the family, let me just say thank you to all of you uh, for being here today. You, you don't know what an encouragement it is to have you with us. And uh, all of you uh, have known uh, the Shelton's mom and dad over the years. And uh, just, we're just so grateful that you're here. I'm, uh, my name is Brad Holsey. I'm married to Sherry, a uh, little child of the Shelton family. We had our first date in October of 1975. And uh, that began our relationship. We served together in the wild, summer of 76, and things went on, and uh, we decided, boy, I think I want to ask this girl to marry me. So I'll never forget sitting in the living room at their house here in Greenville. And I, I just didn't know what to say. I wanted to do this. And I'm stumbling around, and finally, Dad says, so you want to marry my daughter? <laughs> and so I said, yes. I do, and that began a wonderful time with this family, uh, getting to know Becky, Paul's daughter, and Dan, and now her spouses. And today, uh, I, I just want to be able to read some of the things that uh, they have written, along with some of our grandkids, uh, to be able to share with you today. And uh, mom and dad had, of course, the three children, uh, six grandchildren, and now seven great-grandchildren. And I wish they could all be here today. They're here with us via Zoom. Uh, so they are kind of a, a part of it. Uh, all the way from uh, Afghanistan to Michigan to St. Louis. They're here watching. Uh, I wish they could be with us. But let me just share a few words. If they were night, I asked them to write. And Becky, she started. She I remember the things that they remember about that that stood out. Becky wrote, faithful is a word that comes to my mind when I think of my dad. Faithful to his wife, faithful to his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Faithful to his ministry, and most importantly, faithful to his Savior. He was an example to, she was, he was an example to me of unselfish service, for he pastored and then traveled to churches to share God's truth. But it was the time that he took with his kids, even when very busy, that we saw his unselfish love. When we'd have a few days as a family, he would take each of us aside to find out how we were doing and to listen to our cares as well as our successes. And when I was 12 years old, after meeting at a camp, my dad led me in prayer as I confirmed my salvation. I'm grateful for his example of fatherly love that pointed the story of my father. What a privilege for a dad to lead his daughter to Christ. My wife, Sherry, writes, Dad was a spiritual giant in my eyes, but that picture is reflected more perfectly in a memory I will hold forever. When I was young, maybe 10, we were living in our house in uh, Waterford, Michigan at the time. I was asleep and woke enough to hear someone whispering. I opened my eyes to see my dad kneeling beside my bread, my bed, praying. God has blessed us with a heritage of intercession and example, and we are challenged to carry his legacy to our children and our grandchildren. Psalm 145 verse 4 says this, Let each generation tell his children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. We seek to do that in our lives. Dan uh, kind of brings us a little bit closer to where we are today. And he wrote this, he says, these last few days have been difficult as we've watched Dad struggle with his last breaths. The Lord reminded all of us of one of Dad's favorite verses, Romans 8, 28. As a young boy, it seemed like a day never went by without Dad emphasizing and applying that verse to whatever circumstances might have come up in my life. Not until I grew into adulthood did I really appreciate that verse and what it meant. In my dad's Bible, he wrote alongside that verse, Not all things are good. Not all things are good. Man is believers, and those that love God, we know that God can, uh, God can weave those bad experiences into a beautiful tapestry that honors him and gives him glory. I think 
all of us as believers, we have to say yes. Uh, experience that maybe it wasn't bad at the time, but ultimately we know that all things do work together for God's glory to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. It became clear to us as dad laid his thoughts was dead for days on end that he and his family were still uh, that he and his family are still able to testify to God's goodness and hopefully we made an impact on some of the caregivers who were by his side. Perhaps the greatest comfort of Romans 8.28 are the first three words. And we know, Adrian Rogers once said, this is not conjecture. It's not happenstance. This is not perhaps. This is not maybe. This is an ironclad certainty. We know that all things work together for good. Uh, I think it was maybe the Monday before uh, he passed. Um, Dan and I were in the room and Dad was looking off to, uh, to the right and we asked him, Dad, what do you see? He said, heaven. Believe God gave him a glimpse of the Lord. Even as Stephen was being stoned with a wax, he looked up and he saw the Lord Jesus standing in the right hand of the throne of God. We don't know what he saw. God gave him that moment to help him finish the, uh, the marathon in Belfast he was in. My son Chad, I'm going to share something from several of the grandkids here. Uh, Chad wrote, uh, we were living in Colossal, Michigan when Grandpa led me to the Lord at a young age. Incredible. I love this story. I remember running upstairs and telling Mom right away. It wasn't until later I'd become older that I started to appreciate and understand the message of all of his prophecy conferences. I'd heard the sermon several times and remember all of his jokes. I wish I could listen to them again again, and laugh as though it was the first time I'd ever heard of the joke. And you've heard his jokes, Chad says he almost, he almost lost half the room by the time he got to the punchline sometimes. He just drug it out. You know? <laughs> My earliest memory was sumo wrestling in great grandma's apartment. Great grandma would tell us to keep it down, so grandma would try to teach me the, this lip curl thing, and I'm not sure what that is. But uh, Chad says, I still can't do it like him. I would love building blanket forts in his backyard and sitting in them, eating frozen grapes, listening to the stories of the jungles of Angde. All the kids remember that. Jungles of Angde. He would con us into cleaning up the acorns in his yard by giving us a penny for each acorn we picked up. My favorite room in the house was his office. I would love looking at his trinkets from all around the world, listening with wide eyes as he told stories of his experiences in the mission field. Almost every time we would go to golfing, it's a golf course, as you know, over by, it's called Hillendale. We call it Hill and Duck. No offense to him. But he was, dad was better than all of us. And he just loves. When we got home, we'd go swimming in their neighbor's pool and have Competition, family laps, we could swim in the water by holding our breath. He and Grandma accepted Sarah, Chad's wife, and the family right away. We had such fun going to the house while we were going to Bob Jones University. He would make Reuben sandwiches and curry and then would play a game together. And he had always <laughs> he had always asked me this point phrase. Does she turn your mother over? <laughs> He said, yes, and then she still does. God, we missed by so many people. Grandpa, we missed. I know he is now the place we all long to be. No pain, no suffering. Singing along with the angels, worshiping God all day. Cameron, uh, Dan's son, said, some of my best memories of Grandpa Shelton were Thanksgivings spent hearing, without, hearing the stories about his mission work in Vietnam and Okinawa. And having, him rake, and having him rake leaves with the grandkids so we could jump into uh, jump into them when we were younger. Also the chance to hear him speak at the 
different churches he traveled to talked about uh, about the end times uh, because he is the only preacher that would make the book of Revelation interesting and less confusing. Our daughter Christy said there really isn't a way to sum up one of my favorite people in the whole world and to put into words all the things uh, he was to he was to me feels wrong because I can't. There was the way he answered the phone when I could call. Christy Bell Michelle, how was my firstborn? Let me get grandma on the line. He would always do that. The way he would sing in church and grandma would always sing harmony. The way he took his time to take each of us to his bedroom, sit with us on the bed and focus on just me or just us. His tents and yes, his frozen grapes and a little wave in his hair that was always perfect of cardigans, his toeless slippers, and life lessons we learned from the jungles of Hang Day. The way he would get so excited about spaghetti, like it was the most amazing meal he'd ever had, uh, and he'd ever had eaten, and the way Grandma uh, split everything, even coffee, the way he would mix the different boxes of cereal when the boxes were almost gone, the way he closed his eyes so tight when he prayed. He was so dear. Hold these memories in my heart forever. And Kyle and son, when I think of Grandpa, the memories that come to mind are from the early childhood. Every year we would drive down to South Carolina for Thanksgiving. When we would arrive, perhaps uh, we would arrive, Grandpa would be outside breaking leaves for us to jump in. It was always one of my favorite things to do when we first got there. Other memories I will always remember are the times Grandpa would sit sit down on the swing with you and talk about life and ask you how you were doing. I always cherish how Grandpa genuinely loved and cared for others. He was so devoted to sharing the gospel with others. And when he talked with you, he always made you feel that his attention was focused on you. I'm thankful that I had a Grandpa that loved the Lord, loved his family, loved his family well. I look forward to seeing him in heaven again one day. And Laura, um, Mark and Becky's daughter, uh, she wrote similar mem memories of our Thanksgivings. Every year, for I don't know how many years, we would come from where we were in the country to spend Thanksgiving with them. And ultimately, it would be the kids out in the tent, just a blanket hung over, I don't know what, eating frozen grapes. The stories from the Hang Dang Jungle, which is a make believe. Jungle, but he made it up and he would tell these stories to the kids they hope they remember them to, to these days uh finally dad would break out a tape report we'd be around the piano in the living room and we would all sing and kids would play their instruments and laura she was just a little gal at that time and uh laura you'll remember this and she had this suzuki violin and it was just screechy and dad would just sit there with the tape recorder and he says, oh, Laura, that is the best I've ever heard. He would tell that to all of us. We cherish the memories of dad, most of all. Uh, we miss him greatly. Uh, life will not be the same but, uh, without them, but we look forward. Pastor Monroe quoted that verse First Thessalonians 4, where Paul says, Brothers, we would not have you to be uninformed or to be ignorant about the coming of the Lord. Uh, we don't grieve as those who have no hope, right? Uh, all the stories, all the verses of scripture that we've memorized and know, it comes to the point do you really believe what you believe is really true. And we stand here today with that blessed hope that is in our hearts that not only is he in reunion with his Savior, the visible presence of God, but with those who have gone before, we look forward to, to that day when we can be together again. And we're going to sing a hymn right now. It's called The Still and Soul. And there's a verse in there, the second verse. I really want you to pay attention to the words to that because they bring incredible comfort to us during this time. But would you stand as we sing? Please?
constant encouragement and continue to call him pastor all these days. We who have been grateful for Nancy Shelton's godly example rejoice that pastor has been reunited with her in glory these past few days. Together they are rejoicing in their Savior. May his example continue to motivate us to hear the words, well done 
thou good and faithful servant the words the pastor has already heard from the Lord Jesus. Jim wrote this on behalf of myself, Mark Allison, Bill Tipton, Bob Dickey, John Treras. I noticed that Jaleski is here, another one of the boys. After I came to faith in Christ and started attending First Baptist Church in Pontiac in the late 60s, I was mesmerized by the preaching of Bob Shelton. I remember a message from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. That was past passion in Christ. When I got to Bob Jones in the fall of 1971, I wrote him a letter to thank him for that sermon in particular and his influence in general. He wrote back a letter I still treasure to this day. Your comment about the influence that God allowed me to have in your life not only brought a tear, but was a means of great encouragement. And said this, for unless God uses us to exalt his son and direct others to him, there is no purpose. Well said. My pastor always exalted Jesus Christ. In the summer of 1974, we put together a little gospel team of Bob Jones students. Unofficial, they probably never knew. Terry Haskins, who also grew up in First Baptist Pontiac, was our song leader and trombonist and soloist and personality. His sisters are here today. Dave Chickery, another BJ student, played the piano and was a mechanic. Some say he played the piano like a mechanic. But we had a very unreliable band. He made the thing run for the whole summer. We were holding meetings wherever we could. I was doing the preaching. Our itinerary had several poles and it opened spots. Our resources were slim. And after a meeting in Atlanta, we came back to Greenville, which was the southern hub of the summer, and ran into Pastor. He said, where are you staying? And I said, I don't know. It was morning and we had a lot of time to find he said, why don't you come and stay with us? And Mrs. Shelton, what an example of a godly leader. And a mom and a wife, she took us in. He took us in. After a couple of days, we were leaving for Florida and then ultimately on to Mexico, and we piled ourselves into the decrepit van. Pastor prayed for us. Then when he was done praying, he noticed tears in his eyes. He gave us $60 a flesh. Now that I reflect upon it, perhaps the tears were him crying because he was afraid for our safety. We had no idea what we were doing. But there were tears of compassion. My pastor is a godly, generous man. I came across a book that was the, oh, I don't know, monthly directory of First Baptist Church of Pontiac. This is called Gospel Echoes, dated December 1967. Pastor Shelton had been at First Baptist probably for three years at that time. And the significance of this booklet he gives to us on the opening page. This issue of Gospel Echoes is dedicated to our beloved Dr. H. H. Savage, who on December 3rd left this physical life for a life Paul described as far better. After several had delivered brief eulogies, Pastor Shelton delivered the main message, the funeral message for his pastor. I read again from the book. Reverend Robert H. Shelton, who followed Dr. Savage in the pastor of First Baptist Church, took his text from Matthew 25, 14 through 21, gave the message, the greater part of which follows. 
That's the story, the parable, the talents. And of course, one individual received five talents and multiplied them to get another five and brought them back to his master. And verse 21 says, The Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And I'm quoting Pastor Bob. I would like to lift from verse 21 four little but very significant words. Thou hast been faithful. I find it easy to think of Dr. Savage as I read about this sermon in Matthew 25. And it's, it is easy for me to think about my pastor as I read his words regarding his. It sounds very much like what Becky wrote we heard a moment ago. He talked about Dr. Savage being faithful to his wife and faithful to his children and faithful to his church. And Pastor Sheldon said this, Dr. Savage was the only pastor I ever had. For he came to this church before I was born. And I couldn't begin to tell you the profound impression he made on my life. If you had asked me when I was five years of age what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have answered, I want to preach the gospel like Dr. Savage. I was thinking of this very truth some years ago while serving in Vietnam. I sat down and wrote him a letter to express my love and appreciation for the fact that he had stood without compromise in a day of compromise. He lifted up Jesus Christ. I confess to him that there was no man on the face of the earth in God's service who had such a profound impact on my life. Then he concluded that brief funeral message with these words. It must be a joy to come to the end of life's pathway and hear a wife say, Thou hast been faithful. To hear children say, Thou hast been faithful. To hear a church say, Thou hast been faithful. But I believe these words of commendation cannot compare with the words found in our text. His Lord said unto him, Thou hast been faithful. Those are the words. My dear pastor, his preaching was biblical, clear, captivating, life-changing, warm-hearted, whole-hearted, always christ honor, from a kind and gentle soul who loved the truth of Scripture. He left First Baptist as the pastor of one church to become a pastor to pastors of many churches. He had a radio broadcast that was somewhat regional in the Pontiac days, and then a radio broadcast that was truly international, felt by the kindness of Bob Jones University. I think of my pastor, I think of the best example that anyone could have of what it is to love her. Preach Christ and to love people for Jesus' sake. The pains of death are past, labor and sorrow cease, and life's long warfare closed at last. Her soul is found in peace. Now toil and conflict o'er. Go take with saints your place, but go as each has gone before. Sinner, save by grace. Soldier of Christ. Well done. Praise be thy new employ, and while eternal ages run, rest in your Savior's joy. On behalf of many pastors all over the world, we say, Thank you, God, for the gift in life of our pastor, Robert Shaw. There's a song that we are about to hear that comes from Pastor Days of the First Baptist of Pontiac. You know, he was not only a great preacher, but he was a very gifted singer. What a beautiful voice. Pass that gift on to his children. 
He would on occasion bless the congregation in Pontiac with a moving solo, at times team up with the youth, youth pastor Charles Green for a sturdy duet, always accompanied on the piano by Nancy Messner, who was the wife of the minister of music. After pastor left Pontiac, some tech gave me a reel-to-reel -reel tape of about 10 or 12 of those songs. Put it on a CD, and in my early pastors, I lived on those songs as a means of encouragement. My pastor constantly said, "Proudly does." Here's one of those songs, ever more appropriate.
maybe one of the stanzas would deal with the fact that the scars of those nails are the only imperfections in heaven. We'll be made complete. There are scars in heaven, and they're his. And they were for us. Sure, your heart, like mine, has been greatly moved by the personal and ministerial reminiscences of Dr. Shelton. Thank you, family. Thank you, Pastor. Your children know he loved you. He told me that often, and he showed it to you often. Thank you, Sherry, Dan, and spouses, and grandchildren who are listening today. I don't think I ever knew a more warm-hearted man or loving man than Bob Shelton. Family told me that he had asked that I reach at his funeral. I, I just uh, couldn't believe it. It was an honor. Uh, I first knew him when I was eight years old. I knew him as the big man on campus. Certain students just stand out more than others. By personality, influence, talents, whatever. Uh, we were in plays together, Shakespearean plays together. And I always loved to hear him sing on those occasions when he did. My father and grandfather uh, had a deep uh, personal attachment to him. Presidents and founders of school, as Dr. Bennett here today knows, there are certain students that you bond with more than others. You feel they are more a part of the team, and their influence is more profound in the student body. They're like sons and daughters to you. So Bob Shelton was to my father and grandfather, and continued in that relationship throughout all the years of their life. He served 26 years on the board of trustees at BJ. He was a wholehearted graduate, loved the faculty that poured their lives into him, and he was one of those reasons that the faculty put up with what they have to put up with in grading papers and doing all the other things. It's for the sake of young people like he was, and continued through life to be continued in the things which he had learned. I want to read to you uh, just uh, three verses, the last three of Psalm 92, and get to thinking about what God might have for this message. But is there anything in the scripture that describes Bob Shelton as I knew him? And my heart went immediately to verse 7 of Psalm 52 that I'll refer to just briefly at the very end. And from there, it migrated to Psalm 92, beginning in verse 13. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruits in old age, they shall be fat and flourishing. Corpulence is not the fat that is referred to either. Your father was a very trained man. And verse 15, to show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness. We'll touch just briefly on this. I feel like we can have prayer be an invitation to go home with hearts overflowing love to Christ. 
and the Thanksgiving for having been able to know his servant without shelter. But there's this brief message I would like to leave with you. Before that, I would like to share with you the last time I saw Mom and they were in the assisted living facility here, very lovely place actually. And uh, I tried on other occasions to go and miss them. They were not in their room. And uh, so I, I went back one evening and they were not in their rooms, but they were in the dining room and finished the meal. The two of them were talking to one of the fellow people there. And I said, hey, how's the food here? Mom said, you know, it's, it's pretty good. It's not like Nanny's cooking. And she it, not, not like her cooking, but it, it's, it's really not bad. And Nan sat there, as you know, she was having some dementia, and she sat there. And... <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, man, I said, you know, it's not that bad. It's, it's really pretty good, man. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'm glad we had that <laughs> experience took us up to the room and he was bragging about these two little rooms that they had, a little kitchenette. He was always so satisfied and so positive and so content with everything there was. He was comfortable in his own skin. He thanked God for everything that there was. The two of them were the quintessential Christian couple in my estimation. I say that with all sincerity. My wife and I talked about that a lot. Together with Nan, his life, I think, their life can be divided into three parts. The missionary years that we've heard about from 1951 to 1961 that began in Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek took his two million man army fleeing from Mao. They ended up in Formosa. The purpose was to recruit go back a stronger army and oust Mao from China. Of course, they never made that. Chiang Kai-shek, being the believer that he was, sent out a call to the American Bible colleges. Please send us chaplains for our troops. My grandfather issued that invitation to the students, and uh, Bob Shelton was one who responded to the call. He spent many months there evangelizing, literally, to several hundred thousand of those two million people. Uh, but before the year, I think, was out, uh, General Isimo's son, who was now the general and a reputed atheist, sent the missionaries packing. We don't want you here. You will demoralize our troops. They will lose their will to go back and fight. And with a broken heart, the father had to acquiesce to the son that now had that authority to do what he did. And from there, my children came back, got married, they went to Okinawa, then to Vietnam, where he planned to spend his life, I understand. And while they were home on furlough, Vietnam fell. Foreigners could not go back safely to that country. And so they stayed here. Second part of this life, pastoral years, in Pontiac, 1970, uh, from 1962 to 74, and then the prophetic years of evangelism from 1974 until he couldn't preach anymore. You could say that Bob Shelton lived three lives in one. We celebrate today the promotion of that earthly life to the heavenly life he is forever in the presence of the Lord. He spent the years here proclaiming. Psalm 92, these verses that we read, I believe are a word picture of Bob Shelton. Planted in the house of the Lord, flourishing in the courts of our God, bringing forth fruit in old age, Fat and flourishing and showing that the Lord is upright. He is 
my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. What does it mean here that when it says those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall be these things? How do you get planted in the house of the Lord? Well, you get saved. As a five-year-old boy, he was planted in the household of faith. He was in the family, the household of God, where almost everyone in this room would profess to be part of. We are part of the family that was also his family. Galatians 6.10, Paul admonishes to do good, and especially to them who are of the household of faith. He entered the household of faith as a five-year-old, but he spent his life encouraging those and doing good to those in the household of faith. He loved the brethren and spent much of his life Investing in them, doing good to them. And as a member of the household of faith, he bloomed beautifully in the courts of God. What are the courts of God? It's the place we come to worship God. That's where he was planted and he bloomed. His family took him there as a young boy to worship God in the church. Pastor Daniel spoke of as being part of it. It was the courts of God. It was his worship place. He gave his life for the church of the redeemed. It was a pleasant life. Lived in a pleasant place. I like what Ephesians 2.19 says. Paul, speaking of the redeemed, said, You are no more strangers and foreigners, but of the household of faith. Every family who knows God as his family did. Must certainly feel the responsibility to put their children in the courts of God, in the church where God is worshipped. And he had parents that, to whom he owed so much of his life because they started him well as a member of the household in the courts of God. He never got over it, he understood the essential nature. And he gave much of his life as pastor of a church, but before that, in the planter of churches. And after that, in the encouraging of churches everywhere. That's the prophetic part of his ministry. You know, that prophetic part of his ministry has, has already been referred to by Pastor Monroe. I thought he was going to steal everything I wanted to say. <laughs> you couldn't talk to him any time at all. I mean in five minutes of any conversation about any other subject, he would somehow find his way to the rapture. Oh, you know he could come today and then he would proceed to prove it with Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and First Thessalonians 4 and the last half of the book of the Revelation. And you never got tired of hearing it. As a matter of fact, he wore well. He wore well, not everybody wears well. They can be very nice people, but a little goes a long way. <laughs> he wore well. Uh, Brother Brad referred me to Robert Murray McShane's quote because he thought it explained well as much of his father-in-law's life. 
McShane said, men return again and again to the few who have mastered the spiritual secret whose life has been hid with Christ in God. These are of the old time religion hung to the nails of the cross. I think that's a great description. That's why churches had him back again and again and again with the same message. When Brad gave me Dr. Shelton's Bible, I brought it back and said, You are, I'll get it to you. I looked through that Bible and you know those passages that had the heaviest markings and the most notes everywhere? I don't know how he could keep them all straight. They were the prophetic passages in the Bible where he submerged himself through so much of his life. He came back again and again. We had it at the university again and again, in Bible conference and in chapel. Those messages never grow he was always learning something new and fresh as he studied the scriptures. He just wanted to tell everybody what the Holy Spirit had shown him. In old age, the tree flourishes more and more. He has a radio program that you may not be aware of that continues to Today, I think on some 175 churches, uh, stations around the world, the Gospel Fellowship Association uh, said, We'd like to put this together for you and help you to get this out. And when he couldn't stand in a pulpit anymore, and that frustrated him very much, I think every preacher must feel that way when the time comes. But he said, But Bob, I still get to preach on 175 stations all over the world. And I still get letters. He flourished more and more in his old age and in his personal life. With his gentleness and his warmth and his joyousness, his humility, never self promoting, always small in his own eyes. I read about Teddy Roosevelt, who, as a student of natural history, teamed up with a naturalist named William B. And they would speak long into the night with each other about natural history. And often when that was over, it became almost legendary with those people who knew they would go outside and look up into the dark sky to the constellation Pegasus. And down at the left, corner of Pegasus was a small, almost indistinguishable little piece of light. And Roosevelt, they would do this, they would say the same words. He would look up there and he would say to me, that's the galaxy of Andromeda. It's part of our Milky Way. It's, lar it's larger than our Milky Way. It's one of 100 million galaxies. It is 750,000 light years away. It consists of 100 billion suns, each larger than our own sun. And there would be a pause. Roosevelt would grin and would say, No, I think we feel small enough. Let's call it a day. <laughs> always considered himself small. But his journey was to make God big enough. So much as it's humanly possible. To magnify to God. He wanted people to see him. Not his son. And so his mission was to show that the Lord is upright by rock and there's no unrighteousness. This psalm, the part I did not read to you, speaks of cedar trees and palm trees growing in the courts of God. But in Psalm 52, David described himself 
I am a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God. I see and will always remember Dr. Shelton as the tree that was planted in the house of the Lord. David saw himself as a green, a flourishing olive tree. I read that an olive tree produces about one gallon of olive oil per year. It may not seem like much until you have a whole grove. I'm sure, I, I, I know, though this man, Bob Shelton, had a prolific, a worldwide ministry, he never saw it as being very much. And I know he would like you to be encouraged today that as olive oil was burned and produced light in the Middle East at the time of day, so your little burning my little burning, insignificant as it is, is giving the light of Christ to somebody in your sphere of influence who would never see Christ without the burning of your life. Who's going to take up his ministry? of intruding into people's thoughts the reality of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. When people would call me over the years and say, you know what a good one they would speak of? I'd say, yeah, I don't want it. Not part of the doctrine. I wish I could have named others along with him. But who is preaching Thank you, Dr. Shelton, for the shining of your life, for the engaging of our minds to the reality of your hopeful message. 
for those who've trusted in the mercies of Jesus, the saving grace. There's a great day coming. First John 3 tells us every man that has that open your life yourself. I must tell you, dear friends, in all sincerity, if I could be like Jesus, and I would like to, if I could be more like Jesus, what would I look like? Like Bob Shepherd. Also, no hand. You were in Jesus' presence. He's finally home. We may be very soon there. Each of us. Because Jesus may come today. I can't quit without saying that. <laughs> See him someday and he'll ask me why. <laughs> we'll be finally home. And then let's be faithful like he was. Let's stand, shall we? And we're going to sing the song. Finally home.
we were able to perform your own work through his life for your glory. And we rejoice today on his behalf that what he accepted by faith now is able to see by sight. So, Lord, we pray you would hasten the day of your return. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. David's asking to announce that uh, following the service, there is going to be a private uh, middle service, but uh, happy.